Hallelujah. We've been talking about here on uh, Wednesday nights, except for the uh, Passover week, the thought walking in the perpetual covenant, the covenants of God. And uh, I think these covenants are very important. They work. They work. I, I'm a covenant man. I believe. I believe in the covenants of God. I believe God is making a way for these covenants. Uh, God cannot lie. The Bible is very clear, the things that God cannot do, and one of them is God cannot lie. God will not go back on his word. Amen. That's right. He established everything on his word. And uh, you know, people say a man's only as good as his word. Well, God's is only good as his word. And the truth is, God will never, ever, 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 right. as many evers as you want to put out, God will never, ever go back on his word and so in this covenant, we've been talking about the importance of the covenant, how uh, the covenant that we have when communicating, I call it a covenant of prayer. Then we called it a covenant of freedom, how we're free. And then last week, we talked about this covenant of health. Thank God we're healthy. Thank God we're whole. Thank God we're victorious. You know, I, I really believe, I've watched God do some supernatural things, uh, some supernatural things in our life. And uh, today, tonight, I want to talk about the covenant of life, the covenant of life. I want to talk about life. Now, every time you read the word life in the, in the Bible, it doesn't always mean Zoe. Just like every time you read the word love, it doesn't always mean agape. And uh, one is the God kind of, you know, love, the agape love. And another one is a, uh, a man love, a brotherly love, a brotherhood love. And so you've got to understand which life word you're dealing with when you're dealing with this. I love this thing about the life of God because when the life of God moved in, it took, they, it took that which was dead and brought it to life. The life of God is resurrecting life. It's resurrecting power. It takes that which is dead and it comes to life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. A man is spiritually dead. His spirit is dead. But when the Zoe of God, the life of God came in, it brought life, resurrected that dead man and brought him into a state of newness, a state of life. And that's what, that's what happened there. Uh, eternal life he has given us is the eternal life of his nature. We have eternal life that's from the nature of God. It, it, will never, it will never fail. Everything is there. And so if you're taking notes, let me give you some things here. There are four different Greek words, four different Greek words, which I'm not going to deal with the other three because that's not my message. My message is this life. There's four Greek words. I did a lot of uh, looking at these words this afternoon. But the one we're going to look at is zoe. Z-O-E, zoe, which simply means the life of God. Uh, the first time I really read about this was back during the time I was in Bible school and Brother Hagen wrote a book called Zoe, the life of God. And, uh, and so that's where I uh, started finding interest in it. And then I read a book by John G. Lake called The Adventures in God. And he brought more things about the life of God and the power of God and the manifestation of it beyond anything that I ever heard when it came to the power of God. So number one is Zoe, the life of God. Number two is Suche, which is the nature for human life. It's the nature for human life, the natural part. And then there's bios, the, another Greek word called bios, which is um, just the manner of life. What manner of life is, and that's how it describes it, the manner of life. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the last one is uh, anostrophe. That's the Greek word. I had to really look that one up, anostrophe which is a confused behavior. Now, I'm telling you what, I think I see that one a lot. A confused behavior. Now, here's the thing. It's sad that the church has majored on manner of life or behavior rather than eternal life. 
We be in the church, we ought to know more about the Zoe than we do all the others. That's why a lot of people understand the others, except in their nature, that's how they do that. That's how they operate. They understand that natural for human life is I have life, I have natural blood in me, I live, I can see this. Uh, if you're, if this uh, body is damaged, you die. It's a natural death. There's funerals. Uh, they look at that kind of life, and and they uh, and they they look at you know different behavioral ways of life. But the life that we're the life that we should know and understand is the life called Zoe, the life of God, which goes beyond anything that you could ever imagine. When this whatever this life touches, it resurrects. I'm telling you, this life is filled in the absolute nature of God, with the absolute nature of God. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah. Glory to God. All five said, yeah, glory to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. You always, I'm usually reading verse 1 and, and down to verse 11, but verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So he says, don't walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. They're, you you got to do, do, do it different. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from this life, being alienated from the life of God. They walk in darkness, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, it tells you why this happens. Who being past feeling, having given themselves over to lewdness, to work uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have, you have heard him and have been taught by him, so the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, your former lifestyle, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now I want to go back and really focus upon seven, uh, 17 and 18. This all goes together. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest, uh, the rest of the Gentiles walk or the heathens walk in the futility of your mind, having their understanding darkened. We don't want our understanding darkened. We want it enlightened, right? Yeah. Having our understanding darkness, being alienated from the life of God. What we want to do is step into the revelation of the life of God and never be alienated from it. So Paul, in this whole area, his heart is for them to have understanding about how good God is. That's why he prayed the prayers in chapter 1. He prayed prayers over them in chapter 3. He wants them to know that their understanding does not have to be in dark, being darkened. He says, my desire is for you that your understanding being enlightened by God. God wants us to be enlightened by who he is and the life of God that's within him. Jesus is life. Jesus is total life. There's no darkness in him. There's no darkness in him. Now go with me to the book of St. John. St. John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1. St. <clears throat> John 1. Verse, the first five verses. In the beginning was the word. Now, we have talked and explained this so many times. You'll probably just turn me off if I started doing it again because you've heard it enough, right? Wrong. But I understand how people can be. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Before he was Jesus, his name was what? The word. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. In him was life. What life? Zoe. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. 
In him was life, and his life was the light of men. Now, when you look at this and understand, I'm going to go back uh, to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read this verse, uh, I want to read this verse and uh, verse uh, 17 again, and verse 18. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in him was life, and his life became light. His life, his life became light. Now here it says in verse, eight, verse 18, Ephesians 4 again, having their understanding darkened. Why? why? Why is it darkened? Because the light is not there. Being alienated from the life of God. Where there's life, there's light. I want to say that again. Where there's life, there's light. Where there's no life, there's darkness. That's why people that are unsaved, they walk in darkness. People that are born again walk in light. The path of the righteous get brighter. Why? Because the life of God is in us, and where there's life, there's light. See, the Bible talks about God is light. There's no shadow of turning. That means God has no shadow. There's no dark spots to God. It doesn't matter who you are or what happens. Uh, there's always a shadow that is cast. Even this basket and podium has cast a shadow. Even these flowers cast a shadow. Underneath every pew, is, there's, a, there's a shadow cast. The truth is, God, there's no shadow of turning. God is so full of light. If God walked in and manifested his glory inside this place right here, if God showed up, it would be just as much light under the pew as it is above the pew. There is no darkness in God. That's why as born-again people, there should be no darkness. Don't walk as the Gentiles walk in the lust of their mind. Come out of darkness and come into light. This verse that we read over real quick in John is so powerful. In him was life. What kind of life? Zoe life. Zoe life. In him was life, and his life became light. His life became light. Go to chapter 5 of John. I'm going to skip over about four chapters, and I want to bring another verse in here. Verse 24 of chapter 5. Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my word... And believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Now, that's almost say if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, something happens, don't it? Jesus, if you have a red letter edition, Jesus said, most assuredly or verily, verily, this is for sure, I say unto you, he who hears my word. Now, I didn't say listens. Let me tell you something. There's a difference between listening. I have... You have people that listen to you, but they don't hear a word you say. That's almost like politicians. People will write in, call your senators, call your congressmen, call them and tell them, tell them, tell them. They listen, but they don't hear. Jesus said, having eyes they see not, having ears, not just politicians. I'm talking about general now. Having eyes they see not, having ears they hear not. Just because someone's listening doesn't mean they're hearing at all. We say, are you listening to me? We should be saying, are you hearing me? Because until you're able to hear, you don't get it. And you hear as much in here, you H-E-A-R, as much as you H-E-R-E, hear. You've got to hear in here. You understand? You've got to be able to hear, not just here, but here also. It's a lot of here's. You just got to spell them right. You got to be able to get it. I say unto you, he who hears, H-E-A-R-S, my word, and believes in him who sent me has what? Everlasting life. Everlasting Zoe, glory to God, everlasting. Folks, let me tell you, we are everlasting beings. I have everlasting life. No man, people say, 
Let me give you a verse. John says, no man can pluck me out of God's hand. No man has the power to take me out. Now, I believe I have the right to lay down what I have. But no man has the ability to take me away. No, no weapon formed against me. No principalities, no powers, nor angels, nor things present, nor things that come shall separate me from the love of God. I'm set. I'm walking with God. Who's going to go with me? I'm telling you, I'm not with God. I'm not walking to the course of this world. I have come out of darkness, and the last place I want to go back to is darkness. I've come out of not having enough. And the last place I want to go back to is a land of not enough. I don't even, go, I don't even want to live in the land of just enough. And right now, during this crisis, people are in a land of not enough and just enough. But I'm telling you what, you walk in the life of God and let his life bring light, you will come out of this back into a land of more than enough again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He shall, if you believe and you hear his words, if him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto what? Life. We have passed from death unto life. Hallelujah. We have passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, most assuredly, definitely, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. It's not just coming, it's right now. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will what? Live. Those who hear will live. Those who will hear the voice of the Son of God will live. Folks, we're going to have to preach this gospel and allow the uncompromised, anointing word of God to come up out of us and allow that word to bring life into people and let them come out of darkness and live. For as many, for as the Father has life in himself. Now, what kind of life does God have? Absolute life. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Glory to God. How about dance on that one? The Father has life in himself, so therefore the Son has life in himself. Now, if the Father has life in himself and the Son has life in him, then you know the Spirit of the Father is life. The Holy Spirit of life. That's the one who brings the life. Now he says, if I abide in him and he abides in me, the life that the Father is that was put into Jesus and that nature came into me. I just don't have access to the life of God. I'm in the life of God. And the life of God is in me. Well, that shouting material, Pastor, was well, shouting material makes you want to shout. You saw me. Woo! But that's not what gets you delivered. What gets you delivered is hearing and believing. Because this life is what drives out darkness. This life drives out addictions. This life is what drives out all the anger. This life replaces everything in you that's not right. Amen. This life is the best replacement plan you've ever had. The best replacement plan you ever had. Josh bought a new rod and reel a week ago. With his own money, he worked, did yard work, and got his own money, and, and uh, Angel found the receipt. Now, he ended up paying like, I don't know, $130 for this thing, and... Uh, she said, uh, he paid for the uh, replacement insurance on this thing. I said, well, he's playing on using it, I guess. He, play, he bought the replacement insurance on it, on that, uh, like $4 or something. So if something happens to that rod, I guess he can, whichever one, get a change. So what they say is when you buy something, you want the replacement insurance on it. You want the replacement on it. Well, you know, very seldom do I ever take the replacement insurance. Very seldom. But there's something about it. Let me tell you, there is no replacement. Nothing can replace what the, what the life of God can bring on the inside. It eliminates, drives out, 
it, it just totally brings you into a place of wholeness with the Father. See, you got to understand that we tell kids when they're young in Sunday school class, where does Jesus, we ask them, where does Jesus live? And they say, in my heart. What some spiritual person says, he can't live in your heart. He's at the right hand of the Father. How can he live in your heart? I had someone say, I didn't say to me, I heard him say, you shouldn't be telling kids that Jesus lives in their heart. He's at the right hand of the Father. So he's not omnipresent no more. He's not, he's just, just there. God's not omnipresent. Well, he lives in us by his spirit, the Holy Spirit. He dwells in there. Let me tell you, he lives in me, in him. Paul says, in him I live. In him, who is him? Life. In him was life, and his life became the life of men, the light of men. In him I live. So I'm not just living in God. I'm living in God's life, the Zoe life. Nothing touches this life and lives. That life changes everything. When the life of God touched those carrying the casket out of the city of Nain, the dead man, His mother was a widow. He was the only provider. I've preached messages and open air crusades. I just called it. Everything he touches, he changes. Started preaching that back in the mid 90s. When Jesus stopped those bearing that coffin, the mother weeping, when he touched that, the boy came back. Why? Because Jesus touched him. It was Jesus. It was life. Remember, it's, it was life. It wasn't just because he was Jesus. Remember, he said, the things I do, you shall do also, and greater works than he shall you do. It's not because we, we do have that name, but all of that is because of this one thing. It's God's life. God just didn't send Jesus. He sent his life. He sent his life. He sent his goodness. He sent his goodness. Most assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of... I'm still reading uh, chapter 5 again. The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who will hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, does he or does he not? So he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Now, he has the authority. He would not send us out to do what he did if we didn't, if he didn't think we had the same life in us to accomplish it. Years ago, uh, I don't know if uh, Brother Shannon would remember this. Years ago, I I got a call. There was a young boy that was in an accident down here on uh, 127 Barron Street in front of the Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I got a call that he was, uh, he was pretty much in a coma. He was in a coma. And uh, they didn't know he was going to live. And the Lord, about two days before that, called me to a fast like that called me to a fast and I've done been on, I'm done, I've done in my second day of fast. I'm in, I'm going to be in my third day. Shannon Roth, when I went to Miami Valley hospital, the mother was outside the room in just a panic. If her son's going to live or not, I can still see that mother talking to the doctor, looking for every strain of hope she can that her son's going to live. And I remember that I leaned over that bed and and a supernatural anointing, people say it was faith. I I know faith. I recognize faith. It was faith, but it wasn't just faith. I I just said, you live. You live. You live. You live. We walked out of there. I was in tears. And I told Shannon, I said, uh, 
if this is the reason why I'm in my third day of fast, it will be worth it. The boy lived. You live. You live. Well, how, how can you say that? Because life is available to us. Life is available to us. You live. Folks, we have something that the world don't have. And the world ought not be able to take it away. We have something that they want, but they can't get it as long as they stay in darkness. This came as a free gift. You mean you don't have to earn this kind of authority? No, it came as a free gift. It came as life. It came as life. It came as life. John 10, 10. For the thief cometh to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life. Now, did he give us life just so that we could have it and not go to hell and just enjoy our jolly old time, our jolly old self, and, and to pass from, from death unto life spiritually and then pass from death and to life, you know, from physical to heaven? No. He gave it to us to bring us out of darkness so we can become sons and daughters of God, true born again life. But what are we going to do with that life? It's like he anointed the church, but what are we going to do with that anointing? I've come to find out that not everybody knows how to work with the anointing of God. Not everybody understands it. I, I learned this somewhat uh, just by accident. Uh, not, not really knowing God brings things back to your, your remembrance as more so is what kind of was happening. I was meditating on, this is going to, I'm giving you another story to deal with this. I'm going to give you one to deal with this life. I said, a lot of people don't understand what the life of God is for, not just to get you out of darkness, just like they have the anointing of God and don't know how to use it. Some people see the anointing of God, it's just something that makes them feel good. It makes them want to run, jump, and dance, and that's all part of it. There's times I have jumped and danced and ran, and, and uh, there, there is, there is an, uh, an anointing. I've been into uh, Brother Hagin's Holy Ghost meetings, and I mean, you can look at them online. People say, I don't know if I'd buy into that. Folks, I've been there. I'd buy into it. This thing was powerful to see what the Holy Spirit does in the midst of people hungering for a move of God. But sometimes we think it's just anointing to do this. Elijah had anointing came up on him. He outran a chariot. He didn't lay hands on anyone. That's right. So the anointing can do certain things, but I was meditating on discerning what the anointing is for. So if I had to learn what the anointing was for, then maybe we need to discern what the life of God is for. John G. Lake said that I don't just walk in divine healing. I don't just walk in divine health. I walk in divine life. He gave his body to be studied medically. He, he was fascinated with medical stuff and, and different things. And there was a man. I'm going to set this off here. There was a man who had his leg that uh, back in those days and in the uh, early uh, turn of the century, uh, the leg had no life in it. I read this story. The leg had no life in it, no movement of life. That means at the place of amputation, no life in it. And uh, they put some kind of probes to see if, if there was movement of life in. And he says now, he, he went to the scientists, these doctors are doing these tests. He said, now, when you put that strap on there for that probe, Leave room for me to slide my hand in there. And when he slid his hand down between that strap, when those probes, they started looking at the screen, life came back into that limb. What happened? Well, did arteries open? Whatever had to happen, happened, but life came back into the leg. It's not just so you can go to heaven. In you was life. In you is life. It was and it is life. It was in Jesus. And he said that life became the light of men. I don't know how many times he mentioned about 
this life, especially with what we're going through now. My favorite story was how he handled the bubonic plague. Church members were dying and people were dying and it was a real plague. It was a severe plague. It's nothing like we have now. This was a severe plague. Well, pastor, this is severe. Nothing like the bubonic plague. And uh, they were dying by the hundreds. And uh, when he caught on to this, he never lost another church member. They took the foam coming out of these people dying and they put it under their microscope of their day and they could see all of that, all of that virus, all of that plague inside of that. Now he said, I want you to, I want you to microscope that and then I want you to put it on my hand. Are you going to put your gown and your mask on first? No, just go ahead and put it on my hand. Just put it on my hand. And he put his hand and they took it and microscoped that which was on his hand. And everything in it died. Everything in it died. Well, he was John G. Lake. And who are you? Folks, you know the difference between John G. Lake and and a lot of other believers? He believed it. We talk about it. It's good preaching for people nowadays, but he believed it. We have got to get this message out of being just good preaching. We've got to get it in here. In him was life, and his life became the light of men. I'm not going to walk in darkness. It's not God's will for you to walk in darkness. It's God's will for you to walk in victory. I've even thought, I've done it. It's not that I've thought it, I've done it. If he could lay hands on a dead limb and it come back to life, what about on a dead checkbook? What about your money, your wallet? There's nothing in it. Life needs to come into it. Why don't you take hands with your spouse and say this marriage is dying. We're going to get life back into it. We're going to get the Zoe of God in our marriage. We're going to get the Zoe of God in our kids. We're going to get the Zoe of God in it. Hallelujah. The life of God is power. It's the only thing that regenerates an unborn again dead spirit and brings it into life. It's the only thing. It's the life of God that we have. The life of God that we have. Back to John's gospel. I love the gospel of John. Chapter 11. Here's a very popular story that we have here. John 11. The story of uh, Lazarus. The story of Lazarus. Just going to jump right to verse 23 because, uh, or just go to verse 20. Then uh, eleven twenty. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. Now in him was life, and his life became light. Right? She went to meet him. And uh, but but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, "Lord, if you would have been here, your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. Everybody knows it's your fault. My brother would not have died. See, Lord, it is your fault." I hear people blame him today, don't you? Your fault. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Wow. So what if we use his name? I wonder if we get the same benefit. I wonder if we use the name that he said we could use, we get the same benefit. If we use the name of Jesus, whatever we ask, he'll give it to us. I think so. Jesus said to her, your brother will Rise again. In essence, what he said, he will what? Live. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again and live when we're all resurrected in the last day. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And the what? How can he say that? Because he said in chapter five, he said in the father was life. 
And he gave that life to me. I am the resurrection. I am the Zoe. I'm resurrection. I'm Zoe. And he who believes in me, though he were dead, may be dead, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, I believe, Lord. Let me go get my sister. Now, he is the resurrection and he is the life. He that believeth in him, though he was dead, yet shall he live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. What's that life? That's that Zoe. Everlasting Zoe. Everyone has it. That has nothing to do about fleshly, fleshly or carnal life. That is that Zoe life. Now, I want to go to one of my favorite verses. Uh, and that is the book of Proverbs. You thought I was going to Psalms, didn't you? Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. I mean, chapter 4, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Proverbs 4, 20. Actually, 20 is the, the kicker. So let's start here. 20. My son, you can put your name in there. My daughter, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now, how many times have we found how this tied to the heart since we've been reading this tonight? Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life. For they are life. For they are life. Who find them? Is his words life? For they are alive to those who find them. And health, medicine to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, or one says a forward mouth. And put, put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. They are life to those who find them. Now, it's amazing. You've heard me preach this and say it. I remember particularly some person sitting three rows back from the sound booth. I can still see their face. And uh, because that's where they always sat at one time. And during that service, uh, I said something that they thought that I knew was going on in their life. And they got totally offended, not bugged, offended to the point of I'm done with you. I'm done with the church. I'm out of here. And they left. They never came back. I said, the truth is you were not even on my mind. When I said that, not one time did I think about you. You never crossed my mind. And that's when I started saying, it's amazing. You preach one word it brought death to one and life to another. How can that happen? It's because they listened, but they didn't hear. You've got to get out of the place of just listening. That's why the Bible says, the prophet says, hear the word of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It didn't say listen. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He that has ears to 
Let him hear. There's something about hearing that changes everything. You have a covenant in life. If you allow this life of God in you, it will change everything. I find myself more than I really understand, probably more than I notice. When I pray, I pray about the life of God. I command life. I command life. I command life. I command life. I'm so convinced that life is powerful and God is good. There's been two occasions, three actually, where people are at the point of death and just seems like they're struggling getting to the other side. And I said, I've sat with the family and I said, now there's two ways to walk by faith. You've you've got to know how to walk by faith when you're living and you've got to know how to pass on by faith. And just like we agree to live by faith, we're just going to pray right now and release them into the hands of God by faith that they're going to escape this bondage in this natural body and move on with the Lord. Being held captive in a diseased body and ready to go, they want to go. They say their own mouth, I'm ready to go. Well, get out of here. Let's just believe God. It's not the will of God for people lay there in pain and, and torment and suffer. But I know what is the will of God, total life, true life, the Zoe life. And God wants you to understand, you're not just born again in your spirit. The life of God flows through you. Every place this life touches, it moves darkness out of the way and brings life. It brings light. I believe the life of God inside of you has the ability to kill every germ, every disease that it touches your body. Well, if everybody believed it, there wouldn't be any sick people. Well, you're probably right. The problem is not everybody believes it. Not everybody's going to believe it. There's going to be a, there's a lot of Christians uh, that uh, will fight for the right to stay bound. Will fight for the right to stay tormented. But you have a covenant, my brother, my sister. You have a covenant. It's life. It's the Zoe of God. It's the life of God. And God wants that life to work through you. God wants that life to work through you. Life is working in my body. Life is working in your body. Life is working in my, in, in my mind, in my eyes. Life is working in me. Hallelujah. The Bible says, talking about the river of life, everything it touches, things lived. Let there be a river of life flow out of you. In essence, let God flow out of you. Let God flow out of you. I want to pray with you tonight. I'm not just obligated to prepare a sermon. For 14 years, I've never made it about preparing a sermon. Uh, I want to say something every time I'm up here, to affect your heart. Someone asked me more than once, what's the toughest part about preaching? Is, I said simple, people getting used to your preaching. I, if they said, what would you change? I, I like to go back to the place where just looking at, people say, that look, that word, That's the toughest thing about preaching is people becoming adjusted to it. I'm asking you, especially while we're separated like this, please allow the word of God to become life. Please allow the word of God to become life. I'm not obligated to preach a message. I want to preach life. I want to preach something that's going to penetrate your heart. And all I'm asking you is listen with your heart. Hear with your heart and not just with your ears. Hear with your heart and let God do something supernatural in your life. Let God do something supernatural in your life.
He'll do that if you allow him. I want you to stand with me. Father, if I could lay hands on your people tonight, I would. I ask you, Lord, reveal yourself. Jesus, in you was life. And your life became the light of men. In you and in you is life. You was, you are, and you always will be. And it will always produce light. Your life will always produce light. I'm asking you to illuminate her heart. I'm asking you to illuminate her heart. I'm asking you to illuminate her heart. May they get past the voice of Ken Harbaugh and may they hear the word of the Lord. May they get past my little sayings and may they hear you. In the name of Jesus, Father, I speak life, I speak victory, I speak your goodness over them. I decree healing right now, I decree restoration, I decree wholeness. Everything your life touches, it changes. And I decree it now in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, I thank you. Through all of this chaos, we can stand in faith believing it's not going to come near us. Though we're surrounded, it will not come near us. Angels, take charge. Do what you've been created to do. And I decree over you, no sickness, no plague, no disaster, no destruction, no disease shall come near you. Amen.